not that I like to see myself on video. They're on, they're on the internet. People watch them. And I, I know, here's what I know. The word of God goes out. It doesn't return void. So if somebody gets anything, it's touched. Not because of me, but because of my, hopefully, just conveying whatever it is that the Lord wants to say. This word. Somebody will get something. And you can see the countries that people log in. And there's been Middle East countries where people watch the video. There's been Great Britain, Europe, Asia. So the internet is, is a medium just to broadcast Christ. It's neutral in and of itself. Yeah, most of the time it's used for evil, like everything else on this earth. But there's a way to get to the cross. So it's called Back to the Cross, just so you know that's the change. Um, before I start this, I just I want to go into so obviously today is the day that would be known as or we would celebrate. The triumphal entry of Jesus Christ, or commonly known as Palm Sunday, because of the palms that were laid down before him. Um, and the important thing to understand with this is that Jesus was accepting the finality of the work that he was going to accomplish on this earth. That's really what this day was about. His face was set like flint towards what he was to do. Right? It was. It, he knew. He knew what the end of this that week was going to be. He knew that he was going to die on the cross. He knew that. And that's what he set his face to do. So understand that. Understand about what we did today. That we're always looking to that. Every single day for the believer is Good Friday. Right? Every, every day is Good Friday. And what I mean by that is every day we are focused upon our relationship with God. And our relationship with God comes through what? The cross. That's how we get to God. The new covenant. Covenant means bond. We are bonded to God through the blood of Christ. That and that alone, not by your works. That doesn't get you to God. It doesn't impress God. His work on His cross is what He looks at. So turn your Bibles to the book of Colossians, chapter 1. I'm going to start in verse 19. It is okay to observe a day. Right? The Bible says He observes the day, observes the Lord. It's nothing wrong. And, and everything should be an opportunity to understand the Word of God. So it's great. Anything that points to Christ is good. Anything that points to the true and living God is good. But understand, there's no power in a day. There's no power even in the observance of a day. What God looks at is your faith. We believe. And that's what we want. Trust me. Because if we're on a works reward basis, we're also on a works punishment basis. You don't want that. So, Colossians 1, starting in 19. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated, enemies in your mind by your wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ, for the sake of his body, which is the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God which was given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God. The mystery which had been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to the saints. So then God willed to make known what are the riches and the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles in which Christ is in you in the hope of his glory. And him we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, Striving accordingly to his working, which works in me and my brain. The power of Christ, the power of God, the gospel is what the church rests on. Nothing else. That's what we have that's different. Is Christ. The answer. The only thing that can get to the root of your problem, which is sin, is the gospel. That's why that's what we preach. That nothing else. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you, Lord. We thank you for your word, your gospel, your truth, Lord, your blood that was shed and poured out upon that cross, Lord, for the remission of our sins, so that we could be back in fellowship with God, so that we could have the power of 
the living God working in us through His Holy Spirit. His precious, sweet Holy Spirit who comes into our lives to comfort us, to help us, to teach us, to convict us, to do all things through us, Lord, that need to be done for us to have peace and joy and hope in our soul and that which we need. Lord, let us continue in the faith, the true, simple, and pure faith which you've laid out. Lord, you crucified on that cross. Let us have a strength in that. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone say amen. 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 So the Colossians, the book of Colossians is known as one of the prison epistles. Paul wrote it when he was in Roman imprisonment in around 62 AD. And what it really goes into, and the point that it hits on, is the sufficiency of Christ. Christ is not just the, well, put him up there with everything else so you're covered. You know, you've probably seen it before, that coexist bumper sticker, where it's got pretty much a religious symbol from every possible religion under the, the earth. I always thought the S should, or uh, it coexist, there should be a, a dollar sign somewhere in there, because that's usually the where the majority of the world focuses. But either way, all religious uh, symbols. And you add Christ in with, that's what a lot of the world does. They add Christ in with everything else. Yeah, I believe he was a good teacher. He was a good man. He was a moral man. That's true. But this book specifically goes into the fact that he was everything. You can wipe out every other letter in that coexist and just keep the cross. Because that's the only thing that you need. None of the other things will do anything for you. It's not just Christ plus other things. The Catholic Church gets into that really well. It's Christ and Christ alone. And his work alone that you need. And that's what Paul's writing to the Colossians. Because like every other body of believers, they were confronted with false doctrine. You, you will be confronted with false stuff, and you will be confronted with things that are not true, that Satan intends to shake you off your foundation when it comes to your faith. Because he knows it's your faith, and your faith alone that ties you to God. He knows that. He knows that it's your faith that allows you to enter into the presence of God. Because your faith in the blood of Christ, which we looked at in type today, is what enters you into the new covenant. God fulfilled his promise by sending Christ to die on the cross. Your end of it is to believe. To believe that you have a sin debt that needs to be paid. And if you turn towards what God has done, at Calvary, you'll enter into that relationship with Him that you so desperately need, that your soul desperately needs, that your soul strives for, but doesn't find in the things of the world. So these believers were, were presented with false doctrine. I mean, it, it doesn't go into it all that, uh, but it doesn't matter what it is, right? If it's false, it's false. And it will lead you astray. It will lead you towards other things. The world today is rife with false stuff. It's chock full. Probably, I would say, unfortunately, the majority of what you would be exposed to under the guise of Christianity has an element, I mean, you can go far as a strong element of false stuff. And most of it is this, is self is your agent of change. Meaning, if there's something wrong with you, believer, lover of God, lover of Christ, right? and this could be going towards believers, which is what this book was. This book was written to believers who were being exposed and corrupted by false doctrine. So believer, you love God. You know, you, you know the power of Christ in your life, and you change your life, but you still have struggles. You still have problems. You still do some things you shouldn't do. You still think some things you shouldn't think. Listen, if you're in this room right now, and you do some, and you don't do anything wrong. Come to the front so we can all worship you. <laughs> because you aren't here. You don't exist. There's no believer. Who, that's not your God is not ticking off your performance to base His love and His grace for that He's going to give to you. He looks at your faith. Do you believe? If you believe, you are the most worthy candidate to receive His grace. Because when you believe in Him to do it for you, you are taking your hands out of the situation. And allowing the only one in this earth, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches, without me you can do nothing. You are allowing that to take place in your life. If you don't, if you work, if you make self the power to change, what are you talking about, Adam? You're losing me. Right. So, you will hear a lot of this. I'm not going to name names, because you, you know who they are. You will hear a lot of so-called preachers Say, you just need to change your attitude. 
You just need to change how you think, how you speak, and you will change the inside. That is the, exactly what Jesus condemned the Pharisees for doing. He said, you clean the outside of the cup, but the inside is still dirty. The outside, changing your, polishing your outside appearance, is not like, I can come up here, wear a suit, try and look nice, but be rotting inside. It means nothing, right? It means nothing. Your outward appearance is merely that. You're cleaning the outside of the cup, and the inside is still filthy. What's inside is what matters, and what's inside is what God sees. God is not mocked. You're not going to fool him by your actions. You're not going to trick God. Oh, God's going to look down and say, oh, he's acting pretty good. He must, he must have changed. He sees your heart. He sees things that you wouldn't even know you had. He created you from nothing. Your soul didn't exist, and you breathed it into existence. Uniquely. Look around. None of us are carbon copies of each other. He wanted you. That's why he made you. Created. But we try to do that by using ourselves, by using our, our willpower or our, our, you know, our, our own inner strength. Paul said, when I am weak, then I am strong. Knowing that when I can finally admit my own weakness and my own inability to do this and just bow humbly before the throne of God, before the cross, then I'll see strength in my life. Because God will take over and say, finally, you realize who it is who can do this in your life. It's me. Right? You're trusting in me, leaning not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledging me. And then I will work. Right? God doesn't force himself into your life. God doesn't, but he wants you to see your need for him. And a lot of times I'll show you that by putting potholes in your way. That's a good analogy this time of year, right? But put potholes on your path, and you'll, oh, you'll bottom out. And some of us bottom out a lot more than others, right? Myself, okay? And we'll hit that, and God will put that, and you should say, whoa, I want to take a different path. I want to take the path God has. Or you'll keep going. And you'll keep hitting those. Keep hitting those stumbling blocks. But my point is this. These, these folks in, in uh, Colossae were being exposed to this false doctrine. And Paul writes this letter to say, remember Christ? Remember how he's everything? Remember what I preached to you about the reconciliation of his blood on the cross? And that's all you need? Remember that? When Paul said, I determined it to the, this was to the Corinthians, but he preached the same thing everywhere he went. I determined to know nothing amongst you, save Christ and Him crucified. He even said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, right? Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of none effect. And he's like, I'm not trying to use my own power to impress you, which the Greeks were used to, but I'm just preaching the cross, because that's what's going to get you saved. That's what's going to have you living for God. The same thing that gets you in is the same thing that helps you grow. When you say, God, I can't save myself. Wow. I really am bad. And I can't do it myself. I need you. I need you, what you've done for me on the cross. Change me. That's, that's salvation. But that process occurs every day. That's what Jesus said. Take up your cross daily if you want to follow me. If you want to follow after yourself, go ahead. Don't take up your cross. Go your own way. But if you do, every day you need to acknowledge, Lord, I need you as much as I needed you when I first started this, when I first believed, I need you just as much. If not more, you should realize your dependence on him more. As he breaks your pride, as he breaks your will, your stubbornness, and everything, you'll realize, wow, I need him for everything. And that's growth. But that growth doesn't come because you've earned it. That growth doesn't come because you're the hardest working Christian there is. It comes because you're faithful. That's what God wants to see, your faith. He wants to see faithful Christians. He wants to see people who are going to believe. Oh, times are good? Believe. Times are hard? Believe. Times are in between? Believe. Just believe. That's all he expects you to do. And he will work from there. That's the position you need to rest in. It's faith. Wow, everything's falling around, uh, apart around me? I'm going to rest. This God's going to rest. He's going to take care of it. And however it works out is the right way. Because God's never wrong. God has a perfect record. He's never wrong in the way he handles a situation. Whether or not you understand it or not does not qualify God as being right or wrong. You see things in this world that happen. Oh, how could God let that happen? How could God let this happen? Right? Well, God lets a lot of things happen. But trying to say our understanding is the basis for God being right or wrong 
is, is foolish. How about this? All right, explain to me your understanding of the universe. Where it ends, where it starts, how it goes. Right? I mean, science comes up with a bunch of different words. Oh, there's more galaxies, there's more stars. Yeah, but you still can't answer the, con the, the question, where did it come from, and how does it end or start? or No, you can't, because it's God. God's showing his eternal nature through creation. All right? So Paul's preaching this to the Colossians. He's strengthening them against false doctrine. And you know the way to strengthen somebody against false doctrine? It's not to have to pick out each and every false doctrine. That's why you, I'm probably not going to spend a lot of time poking at individual things, even though I was making fun of this morning the, the holy water they sell from the holy land and the, whole, the oil and all that stuff. Sow a faith seed. If you ever hear somebody say, sow a faith seed, turn the channel, we don't give to get back. That's not why we give. We give because we want to see the work of God done on this earth. We want to see more people go to heaven. We want to see more people hear the gospel, which can change lives. We want to see that happen, and then more people will be saved. And that's laying up treasure in heaven, because you're not getting anything for it on this earth. There's nothing that you're getting back. All you knowing is the thought of God's word's going forth. God's word has power. It never fails. People will hear it. People will go to heaven. I don't know how many, where, who they are, but that's it. That's the work of the church. Going ye into all the world and preach the gospel. All right? So... When you hear, and I went on a tangent, but i got to finish it now. <laughs> the faith seed is saying, if you giveth a thousand dollars. And they'll have people say, oh, I gave the thousand dollars and God gave me back ten thousand. God gave me back this and that. First of all, they're probably lying. So I understand that first of all. Um, yeah, I would say they're definitely lying. All right, but the thing to understand here is whatever happened to them wasn't God. Because... God has promised that when you give, you will get back. That's the promise of God. It's the promise of giving. But that's not the purpose of giving. The purpose of giving is to do the work of God. Whatever you get back, however you get it back, that's up to God. That's like giving somebody a gift and then going, well, what do you got for me? <laughs> like Christmas, right? Well, I only got this for you because I thought you were going to give me something better. If I knew you weren't going to give me something better than what I got, you, I wouldn't even got you anything. We don't even do that with other people, yet we're trying to do that with God. Like, we're going to hand God a thousand dollars and sit back and say, what now? Ha ha, like, the ball's in his court? No, it's foolish. Right? Where a man sows, he shall also reap. So if you're sowing in the flesh, you're in corruption. Which is not what you want. All right, so peace. Verse 20. And by him to reconcile all things. So he was talking about the fullness of Christ. The fullness of everything, of everything that is God is in Christ. And by him, I'll read the first verse because they make sense together. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. So it pleased the Father that Christ would come down as 100% God. He was. He is. 100% God. He was also 100% man. Well, how did he do that? Because he's Christ. We can't. He did. All right? Because he was born of the Holy Spirit from the seed of the Father. And he was born of a woman as a, as a man. But he wasn't tainted with the seed of man because it came from the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth, things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. You don't have peace with God unless it's through the blood of the cross. You may even have appeased yourself to, to a point where you feel okay. I hear this all the time. I'll start you know, sharing the gospel with somebody and I'll say, I'm good. I'm good. No, you're not. You're not good. First of all, there's nothing good but God. Second of all, you're not right with God unless you've come His way. Okay? You'll even hear this. Well, I ask for forgiveness. I ask God for forgiveness. I ask. I used to ask God for forgiveness. I used to also ask a priest for forgiveness. But I would ask God for forgiveness. But here's the point. Unless you're coming through the cross, you don't have forgiveness. Right? I can ask for things a lot of different ways, but unless I ask for the way that I'll actually get it, it doesn't happen. God said that peace is only going to come through the blood of the cross. So you are, before you're saved, enemies of God. You are sinful, rebellious human beings that he's created, rebellious children of him, who are running this earth, profaning his name, sinning without any regard to him. That's what you are. And that is an enemy of him. You are against him. You're the former against him. When you come the one and only way, because that sin is what makes you against him, 
Finish your problem. That's it. You don't have 50 problems. Go. Same. It's a sin problem. Until you come the way that pays for that sin, which is the cross, you don't have peace with God. Well, Christ said two things that I want you to understand. Well, this is actually spoken of in Isaiah when it talks about his name. Wonderful counselor. It says, Prince of Peace in Isaiah 9 6. And that's what he did. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the one who orchestrated the peace between God and man. Now God and man can abide together. But he also says, if you notice, in Luke 12 and 51, that he came not to bring peace, but to bring a sword. But what is it? Peace with God is what's created by the cross. But there is a sword of strife. Because he said, even in one house of five, I'll turn three against two and two against three. I'll turn your own house against you when you speak for Christ. Have any of you experienced that? If you take an unwavering stand for Christ, people will be against you. Guaranteed. But that's not your goal here. Is you're not a people pleaser. You're here on this earth to please God. And the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Because let me tell you something. A thousand years from now, even less than that, it's not going to matter what you did to please man. That's not what's going to hold any bearing in eternity. What's going to matter is, and that's your job to walk by the faith of that eternity to come and not walk by tomorrow or what the next person thinks of you. It doesn't mean you need to be unnecessarily confrontational and pick fights with people. That's not what I'm talking about. But you never need to waver on your stand. And when you do, you'll, you'll meet two kinds of people, those who are mad and those who are glad. Right? Those who say, I believe that. I'm changed. I'm, I'm struggling right now, but that's what I need. I know that's true. I know that Jesus Christ died for me. I believe that. Amen. I'm going to accept that. I want to go to heaven. And Jesus will change their hearts. And those who say, I don't need that. Those who experience the offense of the cross, as Paul said. They say, I'm not a sinner. I'm a good person. I get to charity. I do this. How dare you say that? Jesus is the only way. But you know what that is? That's the beginning of conviction. That's the Holy Spirit convicting their heart. So no matter when the word goes out, something happens. And conviction is good because conviction leads to godly sorrow and repentance, which can turn somebody to that. But don't expect everybody to fall at your feet and start worshiping God when you give them the gospel. So you have a peace with God, but a division with unbelievers. And it's not a bad thing to be it's not a bad thing to be disliked by the world. Because they need to see Christ. You gotta understand when the world starts embracing preachers and putting their arms around them and celebrities love people who are unmistakably unsaved, right? Make no profession of Christ in their life. And I'm not just saying people who are living perfect lives. You know perfect lives. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who believe in Christ as their Savior and as their Lord and have been born again. But when people who unbelie are unmistakably not that are saying, I, can, I embrace this message. He's just all about love. He's all about peace. He's all about bringing people together. He's all about bringing unbelievers together under one roof to ease their conscience. As they tread one step towards the, the never-ending cliff of hell. But that's what it is. They won't say that, of course. And me, I'm hateful, I'm angry, I'm a mean preacher. I'm telling you the truth. I want to tell you the truth. Because when you stand before God, all the fluffy things, they're not going to matter. Imagine the preacher who's preaching that fluff now. When their congregation stands, and most of them want to hear that, and they want their ears itched. But they stand before God, and they say, I went to this church, and I heard this, and I gave the money, and I bought the books, and I did this. And God said, well, what about Christ? You never accepted Him. That's the only way to get in. So, you know, you will never leave hell. You will never have a vacation from it. You will be there for eternity. Because they didn't accept Christ. The world stands at a crossroads to accept. So we have peace. I'm going to speak through the end of this. He says, 23, in the body of his flesh through death. So he's talking about making peace. If indeed you continue in the faith. So there's an ability to not continue in the faith. If. Right? That's inserted in there to say, if you do. Showing that there is an if you don't. There is an ability to lose your faith. There's an ability to walk away from this faith. And I believe it is truly hinged on the Word of God. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If you don't hear the Word of God, if the Word of God is not spoken in your life, what are you saying, Adam? i got to read three chapters tonight, four chapters tonight? No. Like everything, as the Lord God leads you, right? 
But yeah, more is better. If you find yourself in the word more than less, that's a good thing. But if your faith is degraded to a point where the things of this world have more appeal than the things of God, and you can say, I no longer believe that. You know, one time I did believe in Christ as Savior, but I don't know. First of all, you're living the wrong life, and that's why you're seeing that. You're not living by faith, you're living by your flesh. So you're experiencing defeat and, and <coughs> suffering and, and all this, these places that God is trying to break you to get you back to the right place. That's why he's letting that happen. But if, if you get to a point where you can no longer say, I don't believe in this anymore, you cease to be saved. You are no longer a believer. All right? You will stand before God as an unbeliever. And in verse 28, Paul says, Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Proclamation is through word and deed. The word preach means to proclaim, announce, or maybe my favorite definition of it, to make known. We make Christ known. We live for God by the power of God, not by our own power. And like any good work, it is made for us. This warns man so that all can be saved. Understand this, and I'm going to close with this. Here's what I want you to understand and get from this about Him we preach, about preaching Christ. You may say, Adam, I don't own a megaphone, and I don't intend on going out in the corner and handing out gospel tracts. That's fine, because the, the Lord probably has not called you to specifically do that. Pro proclamation and making Christ known is this. Are you ready? I'm going to give you the secret. All right, here's the secret. If you stayed this long, you're going to get it. <laughs> Everything I've always ever said. You live by faith. And what happens when you're solely trusting in Christ and what He's done for you, as the basis for your relationship with God, not thinking that you can earn it. There's only two ways, faith and trying to earn it. Trying to earn it is saying, God, you're going to reward my performance. Believing is saying, He's going to reward your faith. And He only rewards faith, so get the performance thing out of your mind. So you're believing in Christ and what He's done for you at Calvary, as the basis for your relationship with God. So everything I ever need, any problem I ever have, will come through that faith. Anything. Anything I ever need. Finances, yeah. bills are going unpaid. Oh, God, I'm believing. So you're going to take care of it all. So I'm going to wait. Help. God, I'm believing. You say you're going to take care of it all. I'm going to wait. That's it. Position of rest, position of waiting on God to work. Okay, you're there. As you do that and live that life, God will lead you. He will guide you. He will light paths. He will open doors. That and that is how you proclaim Christ. Because he will put opportunities for you to minister to other people. But a lot of it also will be the way you live. People will see the hope that you have in eternity, in eternal life, through the Holy Spirit working in you. They will see that. Peter said, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have. That implies that people are going to see the hope that you have, and they're going to want to know about it. They're going to want to say, how did you have patience through that situation? Well, let me tell you about a man named Jesus. And let me tell you about what he did for my life. You're not, if you're in a place, and I, I was in this place, let me tell you. When I got saved, I was like, Lord, i got to be telling everybody about Christ. i got to be doing this. i got to be handing the, the, the gospel tract out, doing this, doing that. But you know what I did? And were those things bad? No. And I, some people were touched. I believe some of it was the Lord. But what happened is, is I, placed, I started to, to place my faith in my ability to do that. And if I didn't do it enough, I felt like I was a second-class citizen of God. I felt like I wasn't doing enough for God to love me or, or give me His grace. I felt He loved me, but I felt like I wasn't going to earn any of His grace that week or that day. Um, I automatically disqualified myself from grace because you can't earn it. It's freely given. Unmerited favor. It means you don't earn it. You receive it, not because you're good, but because He's good. Right? And it comes to your faith. So you live by that faith. And the doors will open. You will do more for God in that position than the person who's outside the will of God trying to impress himself or impress other Christians by how, how many people he witnessed to or how many people were saved under your ministry or this or that. Watch out when you get into numbers. Remember what happened to David when he started counting the people? It's not that. That's not how we base it off whether we've done the right thing or not. We base it off have we been faithful? Have we been faith? And oftentimes it's harder when you don't see the fruit, when you don't see a lot of things coming out of it. But you said, I've just been faithful. Lord. And that is the position that God wants you in. And that is the position. If you're here today as a Christian saying, I, I, I need to know 
what I should do for God. I, I hear this going to all the world and preach the gospel, be a witness for Christ, but I just don't feel like I'm being much of that. Well, join the club. I don't either. Even though I get up here and preach, and I still don't feel like that. But when I just trust in God to lead me and to show me what to do, He opens more doors than I could have imagined. And He puts more things in, in my path. And that's what He's going to do for you. Trust me, you are witnesses. By being saved by the blood, you're already a witness. You're already a witness to the power of God. That He works. That He's real. Allow Him to continually do that. And if you walk by that faith, He will continue to work in your life. And He will open doors and allow you to minister to others. Amen? Well, let's close here. Father God, we thank You. We praise You, Lord. We thank You for Your Word. We thank You again for what You've done at Calvary. There's no words that we have to express it, Lord Jesus, but we just bow in humble adoration, Lord. We bow in what you've done for us, Lord. And let us serve you, not just with our lips, Lord. Let us not just be hearers of the word, but also doers of the word. And your word says to believe and to receive. If we believe, Lord, we'll receive all that you have for us. Just constantly keeping our eyes fixed on you. Keeping our eyes fixed on you to provide everything we need. Let us wait, Lord. Give us the patience to wait on you today, Lord. For whatever it may be. And I know there's people here struggling. I'm struggling. I have things in my life. But the devil is in my ear saying, take control of the situation. Get out there and fix it. Do it. Use your knowledge, your expertise, your wisdom. And figure it out. Rather than letting God and trusting in him with all. So, Lord, let us go forth in that today, knowing that you will put the things in our path that we need to do. We don't need to worry about what we need to do for you. We just need to believe. Just need to have faith in what you've already done for us, Lord. Knowing that all work that needs to be done for your kingdom on this earth is done by your Holy Spirit, working through us as we rest in that faith. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Everyone's sitting. Amen. God bless you. Adam, Adam, I think there's one more announcement. You won't be here next week? Yes. Uh, oh, I, yeah, so for Bible study next week, if you're coming for the Bible study next week, I'm not going to be here next week, so the Bible study is not going to happen. So we'll pick up in the book of Leviticus in two weeks. God bless. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Thanks for the reminder, I guess. No, no, no. I'm not going to